So good day, good day to you. Finsbury Growth and Income Trust is a concentrated stock portfolio. And my focus on this session is to discuss some of those stocks in the portfolio and the opportunities, the opportunities that we see for them. First, though, I hope you might permit me a brief preamble. And what I want to say as a preamble is this. Last week, I had my second jab. And I don't know. I don't know if it's the Pfizer talking, but I have to say I feel really quite stoked at the moment. I feel really quite energized about the much improved performance of the UK stock market in 2021. Um, right now, as we speak, and as I'm sure you're, you're aware, the UK, the UK market is even outperforming NASDAQ in 2021. And long may that continue. How realistic is it to hope that the UK stock market might um, continue this uh, continue this renaissance? Well, I have to say, I, I do think that there is a credible case to argue that this long period of more or less dismal returns from the UK equity market that has resulted in a systematic underperformance for UK stocks. But even so, having said that, I think that there is a far more important factor at work in 2021, or at least I hope there is. And that is, we wonder whether global investors are still underestimating, underestimating a technology-driven upsurge in innovation across the UK, the UK corporate sector. Look, I'm sure you can see it as well as we can. You see it in new business formation. You see it in the IPOs. Uh, we see it in the investment actions of many of the companies that were invested in across Finsbury. And if that's right, that this entrepreneurial corporate sector that we have in the UK really is in the throes of um, you know, an upsurge in the effectiveness of its, uh, its technology investment, then there is indeed every reason to hope that the UK stock market can go on being stronger for longer certainly my aspiration as a career-long UK equity manager. Okay, so that was my preamble. Now, turning to Finsbury Growth and Income Trust, you can see our standard performance uh, uh, slide here. I don't want to dwell on it, except if you'll allow me just to uh, highlight the fact that 2020 was a very significant year for me personally. It was the 20th year of my responsibility for FGT. And, you know, that's quite some stint, <laughs> two decades and counting. And I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit proud of that. And I'm also, without dwelling on this, I'm also reasonably content with the uh, the long term the long term track record. However, and being candid with you, and no point in not being candid. However, I am less than delighted by the more recent relative performance of Finsbury's NAV. Certainly over the last six or seven months, there's been quite a sharp 
deterioration in our relative performance. You can't see it in the 2020 return because we did actually still outperform during calendar 2020. But once the vaccines were announced towards the back end of last year and through into 2021, yeah, we have, uh, we have lost ground. As you can see through to the end of April, we're up five and the all shares, well, I'm pleased that the all shares gone up, <laughs> the all shares up, up 10. So what's going on? Um, uh, two factors here, um, one structural, uh, the other highly stock specific. Uh, and I am going to talk about both because as I alluded to earlier, I, I also think there are opportunities uh, in, in, in some of these recent uh, some of these recent price price divergences. So first of all, our current structural issue, as is I think quite well understood, under my stewardship of Finsbury, we've always had big holdings in big, reliable, steadily compounding companies. Maybe even today, something like 40% of the NAV is made up of companies with those steady compounding characteristics. Now, that was quite a comfortable place to be during the bulk of 2020, but much less so right now, as other investors are looking either for recovery or candidly, I have to admit, other investors are looking for more rapid growth businesses. And, you know, it may well be, at least temporarily, that our steady compounders are being today perceived as dull plodders. Now, listen, I, I might think that that's unfair. I do think it's a bit unfair. But I have to acknowledge, you know, when I look at our portfolio, I have to acknowledge that, you know, an important holding like Relex, which is a business where I have to say we still have very high hopes, high expectations for both business performance and share price or a holding like, um, like Heineken as well, another, in our opinion, structurally advantaged company. Although Relex and Heineken's share prices are up in 2021, they've not kept pace. They've not kept pace with the, with the all share. And actually our archetypal dull plodder and another big holding for us, our archetypal dull plodder Unilever. Now that is actually down in 2021 year to date through to the end of April, down just around 3%. Now I'm showing you this slide. Um, and this is the slide I've worked with before with Unilever. Um, and let me say I, I totally acknowledge that this slide is purely historic. I'm not necessarily claiming there's any predictive power uh, in this slide. But what I would say is that every time Unilever, as it is now, is going through a period of being out of favor with other investors, um, and indeed when these steady compounders are out of favor with other investors, I like to remind myself of just how formidable these companies can be by looking at this by looking at this slide. So here is Unilever's dividend history, as far back as the company can provide the data for. And you know, it's it's a hell of an achievement <laughs> to, 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 to me, to us. Uh, it's an extraordinary achievement over half a century of rising real 
dividends. It, it, it's a very special achievement by that company. And, you know, be in no doubt that that dividend growth has also resulted in very, very marked and attractive capital performance as well. If you go back to 1988, which is as far as Bloomberg will take you, or take me anyway, if you go back to 1988, 33 years ago, Unilever's share price, just purely the share price, Unilever's share price is up 16 fold since then. And that compares to the FT all share index, which is just slightly more than quadrupled. OK, so that is a huge differential. And, you know, really is testament to the sort of returns that successful, steadily compounding companies can deliver for you. Will it continue? We understand. You know, uh, other investors clearly have reservations about it. And, and in the final analysis, we can't know for sure. I, I, maybe I will say this, though. At the end of April, uh, Unilever reported its Q1 results, its first quarter uh, results. They were better than expected. I, I, I believe the share price um, share price certainly rallied on those those Q1 results. You know, and just picking a few statistics out of that Q1 report, I, I, I just think it creates a more positive picture. You know, Q1 to Q1, India was up 20%, revenues up 20%, China up double digits, um, so teens, Prestige Cosmetics up 20%, key brands of the future for Unilever, Ben and Jerry's ice cream up 30% quarter to quarter, Hellman's mayonnaise, uh, Magnum ice cream, Horlicks, nutrition drink, all up double digits. E-commerce, e-commerce revenues up 60% year over year, now 11% of the total. And Unilever argue that e-commerce revenues are incrementally margin improving for the company. So, you know, actually, Actually, there are some encouraging things going on within this formidable business. And I just want to make one other point about the, the first quarter uh, and sort of extrapolate from this to some of the other uh, compounders we own as well. Uh, Unilever announced a share buyback uh, with those first quarter results. Three billion pounds of buyback. That's roughly two and a half percent of the current market capitalization of Unilever. In addition, Unilever also, I admit, nudged, nudged up its first quarterly dividend, only a 2.6, 2.7% dividend increase. But that's on top of the running dividend yield at today's price of three and a half percent. What that means notionally, Nothing ever works out exactly. But what it means notionally, if you add those three numbers together, let's say two and a half plus two and a half plus three and a half, notionally, there could be something like an eight to nine percent per annum return out of this asset, even with no share price re-rating. Now, similarly, another of these I'm going to call them steady compounders that we own within Finsbury. Similarly, just think about Mondelez, which we inherited from our holding in Cadbury. Mondelez has a dividend yield today of 2%. That's lower than Unilever, but that's because it's in structurally more rapidly growing categories, arguably. Certainly, Mondelez's recent dividend growth has been faster than Unilever's. Mondelez's 
dividends were up uh, over 10% last year, and the first quarter dividend also up 10%. And Mondelez, too, is in the process of buying back its own shares in 2021. Maybe 4% of Mondelez's market cap to be retired this year. Again, you add those numbers up, and maybe, maybe there's an expectation that Mondelez's equity might return low double digits, maybe even mid-teens returns. And listen, just to show that that's not complete pie in the sky, consider that last week, last week, Mondelez's share price actually hit its all-time high, and that the stock is up significantly more than 50% since the start of 2019. So I suppose what I'm saying is we understand and we know that you understand that these companies are not Coinbase. Yeah, that they, they don't have those characteristics. And yet there still seems to be plenty of justification for the expectation that they can continue to grind out perfectly acceptable returns you know, as they've done, as they've done for decades. Okay, moving on to our stock specific problem in 2021. That's the London Stock Exchange. I'm showing you the long term um, share price of the LSE here just to give me a happier backdrop. But um, yeah, uh, as is well known, the, the LSE has suffered a severe bout of profit taking so far in 2021. Uh, at the end of April, it was down the best part of 20%. And given that that was our biggest holding at the start of the year, that has been painful, both in absolute and relative terms. Now, look, I, I don't know how relevant it is for me to hold forth on our aspirations for the LSE from here. I don't know how relevant it is, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I'm going to do it because this remains an important holding within Finsbury. Also, because to me, it's become an important company within the context of the UK stock market in general. Also, it might be a buying opportunity. <laughs> Let's hope so. So, you know, this, this transaction, this transaction with Refinitiv, I mean, yes, it is a bold deal. It is, to use the cliche, it is a transformative deal and no question bold transformative deals bring execution risk and the fact is neither me nor the company itself can offer absolute certainty that that execution will be carried off flawlessly let alone let alone successfully but Nonetheless, we think it's so important not to lose track of what's been created by this combination. You know, it's, it's a truly substantive company, the LSE Group. It's a £40 billion market capitalization. It's become the world's number two financial data and analytics business. Recurring revenues are now up to 70% or more of the total, and those are sticky revenues. The company is targeting 50% operating margins, and there seems to us to be credible aspirations for an acceleration in revenue growth from the historic combined sort of four to five percent 
to five to seven percent over the next over the next couple of years. In short, the London Stock Exchange Group has turned into exactly the type of business that UK equity investors like me have been bemoaning the shortage of <laughs> over the last three or four years of poor or disappointing UK equity market performance. Does that make sense? You know, the LSE group in its current form, that's quite a rare company by global standards. It's a very rare company, a globally substantive data and analytics business. It's a very rare company in the context of the UK stock market. There's Relex. I've already mentioned we own a big holding in Relex. And, yep, let's hope that one um, fulfills its potential. Um, Experian is arguably another, and we have a, a growing holding currently in Experian. But after that, not many more truly substantive businesses in this, uh, in this um, category. So look, the share price kissed £100, just under £100 when the deal closed. You can buy it today at 72 or slightly less. That's a meaningful haircut. Um, let's hope it is a buying opportunity. Let's hope it is because <laughs> we are certainly adding to, to our holdings. I've, I've spoken too long about the LSE, but I, I, I'm gonna kind of summarize on it to, to segue into, into my next point. Um, you know, investors have been asking politely, perhaps in some cases demanding the companies that they're invested in. They've been asking them to politely to ensure that they emerge from the pandemic stronger than when they went into it and with superior growth prospects from when they went into it. And absolutely, absolutely, I would argue that that's what the LSE has done. But also, I would argue that there are many holdings across Finsbury Growth and Income Trust for who that is also true. And on this next slide, I just want to highlight um, a few of those, a few of those that are, that, that, that are, that are working <laughs> for us in, in, in 2021. So there are two columns of stocks on this slide. On the right hand, you can see the names that have not worked. Uh, so far, anyway, in 2021, the, the, the names I've already discussed. On the left-hand side of the column, though, some of the positions that have outperformed the FTL share index through to the end, through to the end of April. And I'm just going to pick out a few names here. Um, Burberry is, in my opinion, a very important holding for Finsbury. To us, there is a lot of latent value within this investment. Now, I'm thrilled it's up 15% year to date. Burberry got absolutely clobbered last year. And actually, um, from its low point of last year, the shares are up now nearly 70%, I think, from the, from the low. But just consider this, from its nadir in 2008, over the next five years, so between the bottom of the financial crisis in 2008 and 2013, over that period, Burberry's share price went up seven times, sevenfold increase as confidence returned and the global economy healed itself. Now, will Burberry do that again? I can dream. But I do think Burberry is a company that has not received credit from investors for the expensive investments that the current management team have made over the last three years 
in shifting Burberry's product and image higher up the luxury curve. And I, I, I guess our, our hope is that that investment begins to pay off over the next two, three years, and that it pays off at a time when possibly, possibly the world may be experiencing a kind of roaring 20s. Yeah, we've all heard of this idea of the COVID recovery being a period of roaring consumer consumption. Actually, I don't think it's anything to do with COVID. If there is going to be a roaring 20s, it will be because new technology is creating new wealth and that new wealth is being spent on luxury products and services. Let's hope Burberry's leather goods and outerwear get at least their fair share of that. Now, another company that's likely to be a beneficiary of any possible roaring 20s, uh, another company that could be a beneficiary is Diageo. Um, Diageo had a tough year last year. Again, uh, I'm delighted to see the share price doing better in 2021. It's our biggest holding in Finsbury uh, right now. Diageo is part of that 40% I mentioned earlier of um, steady compounders. And again, Diageo has done well over time. I'm just going to remind you. Over the last 20 years, Diageo's share price has more than quadrupled, while the FT All Share Index, I regret to inform you, because it just <laughs> emphasizes what a tough period this, bit, this has been, the All Share is barely up 40% in capital terms over that, over that same period. So Diageo has done much, much better than our benchmark. We've got every reason, I think, every reason to hope that Diageo does even better over the next 20 years than the preceding couple of decades. And that's because we think there are good grounds to believe that these increasingly apparent trends, secular trends, of people around the world drinking less alcohol, but drinking higher quality gear, and in particular, drinking more premium spirits, that that secular trend is accelerating. And obviously it plays, it plays absolutely to Diageo's strengths, just as with some of those other compounders, Diageo's also uh, resuscitated a share buyback. Mm, and to us, that's nice to see. I think it's really nice to see the board of Diageo uh, sanctioning that buyback, kind of confirming our view uh, about the strategic value in the equity, the equity currently. Looking at some of those other names on the left hand side of this slide, um, we, we do have a couple of companies where there's been heavy investment in digital technology. Nice to see some payback. Uh, 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 for those shares. Um, Daily Mail and General Trust has been a nice contributor for us this year. Um, that stake it has in Kazoo is purportedly, if all goes well, worth nearly half DMGT's market capitalization. If that's right, then this trust structure is is undervalued. The, the Daily Mail general trust structure is, is undervalued to us. Even Sage, which was, I must admit, a disappointing, very disappointing holding for us last year, has perked up in 2021, confirmed by its results uh, uh, last week. Um, it's cloud native products also growing strongly. And just kind of returning to my opening proposition, um, I think it's encouraging, I'm encouraged anyway, to see the three asset management um, investments that we have within Finsbury, to see them all outperforming uh, through to the end of April. That's Hargreaves Lansdowne, 
Rathbones and Schroders. And, you know, I think that does reflect improving business confidence in the UK, uh, and it definitely reflects improving stock market performance by the UK. And if both of those can continue, then, yeah, we've got to be hopeful. We've got to be hopeful that those, uh, those companies can carry on, uh, can carry on re-rating. Okay, I, I think I'm almost at the end of my prepared comments. Thank you for listening to me. I think I did just want to, I just wanted to conclude by um, acknowledging an article, acknowledging an article written by Lawrence Burns of, of Bailey Gifford um, uh, in the Financial Times earlier this year. It's, uh, I mean, the whole article is, is so, so stimulating. Um, and during the course of the article, there was a there was a quote, a phrase that really, really resonated with us. Um, he said something like. Our clients. Always ask us about our cell discipline. But they rarely ask us about our hold discipline. And. Yeah, I thought that that was insightful, true and important because holding on to companies with winning characteristics is sometimes difficult because they don't always perform well all of the time. Um, of course, BG are you know, past masters at that. But, you know, as I hope I've conveyed, uh, you, you know, within Finsbury's, portfolio that that there are companies with winning characteristics and yeah we're certainly intending to 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 carry on uh, to carry on holding anyway with that thank you very much and now happy to take any questions you may have thank you nick for the presentation uh, we have a series of questions now uh, from investors uh, the first of which uh, relates to the beverage companies almost a quarter of the trust is made up of beverage companies are you comfortable with this level of exposure to one industry? I mean, evidently, um, we we are comfortable. I am comfortable with that uh, with that exposure. I sometimes I sometimes wish that it <laughs> it was more than that. Um, you know, of course, it's quite a diverse collection of beverage businesses that we have here. You know, from premium spirits, you know, through through to to national soft drink champions. Um, you know, I think what I would what I would say is that um, you know, right at the start of Lintel Train Limited, we Mike and I said to ourselves, we must invest the capital that is entrusted to us. We should invest that as though it was our own. Um, so to 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 invest it with the same sort of time horizon that we might have for for our families, uh, and maybe with the same sort of conservatism that one might have <laughs> thinking about one's, uh, one's family wealth. And, you know, for decades, we have observed uh, how enduring fortunes, um, enduring family fortunes have been built around the ownership of beloved and um, uh, and resonant beverage brands and it, it's it's just always seemed to us to be uh, a, an industry where the predictability um, of the brands and the profitability of the, the the brands is so high that they they merit absolutely a, a, a core uh, a core commitment you know I think over and above just that desire to allocate really structural long-term capital to enduring enduring businesses, I think what's further been reinforced to us um, over the last couple of decades is the extent to which beverage companies, particularly premium beverage companies, 
act as a proxy for for wealth creation, uh, wealth creation around the world. Um, you know, everybody knows the emerging market story, um, uh, uh, the the transition from drinking local uh, local beverages to drinking to, to 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 drinking international ones, and that emerging market story, I think, is still attractive for a company like uh, a company like Heineken, for instance. But I think what's so interesting to us is seeing how the creation of new wealth, um, technology-driven new wealth, is, inco- is encouraging this incredible acceleration in the consumption of premium spirits. Um, and that's playing absolutely into the hands of Diageo uh, and the investment that we have in, in Remy Cointreau. Um, both businesses performing extremely well and the share prices as well as well I'm pleased to say so sorry long-winded answer but um, yeah I I, I, I I do feel pretty comfortable with that allocation thanks Nick. that's quite a nice route into, into the second question which is can you expand more on the idea the new technology is creating new wealth do you mean company formation unicorns etc or asset based wealth such as crypto? I, yeah, I, I, um, I, I mean the the the, the market capitalizations of of emergent companies uh, of dominant companies in this in this space. Yeah, there's just more more collateral, uh, more equity collateral that's been created. Um, and you're right as well. The new business formation IPOs. It, it is it is creating it is creating new wealth and yeah uh, we can we can we can we we can see the benefits of that in, in investing in the successful the successful emergent companies but also also finding ways to participate in that new new wealth creation yeah via via the the the, the, the savings intermediaries the capital markets intermediaries the luxury goods uh, the luxury goods businesses as well. Um, so, y- yeah, this idea of um, this idea of the Roaring Twenties, um, you know, as I said, uh, you know, a, a simplistic way to to think about that is just oh, uh, 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 a reopening trade uh, as as we emerge from what we've emerged from, uh, and th- you know, there is an effect there. Um, I was amused to, well, I'm not sure amused, but I, I was intrigued to see um, Heineken being forced to acknowledge that it was running out of beer in the UK, um, or the beer that it supplies to its pubs, so strong has that uh, re- reopening uh, trade been over the last six six weeks in the UK. Apparently, you can't get your hands on Amstel or Moretti. Uh, at the moment in the UK, but you know that that's a relatively short-lived phenomenon. Um, I think if there is going to be a roaring twenties, it, 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 it's going to be based around a continuation of this um, this extraordinary trend to, uh, of wealth creation by by new industries. Thank you. With the benefit of hindsight, do you feel that you missed any opportunities during the weakness in 2020? Well, <laughs> of, of course, you know, because hindsight hindsight is such a such a wonderful thing. Um, you know, I felt that by our standards, we were quite active l- last year. Um, we did initiate two new holdings, um, Experian and Fever Tree. Uh, and certainly the fever tree holding we 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 initiated in a i think in a time a timely way um ex- experience been less successful shorter term but but um that creates an opportunity for it, for us to add more to that you know as again as i said earlier i think a very rare uk company that is you know, you know truly um Truly well advantaged from a global perspective in 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 data 
data and analytics. Um, should we have bought more new holdings? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I did feel, and still to an extent do feel, that there were plenty of opportunities to add to existing portfolio holdings during the middle of last year at very, very attractive prices. Um, you know, not least some of those beverage, those other beverage businesses. We, we, you know, we did buy more, more Diageo into weakness last year. Um, again, you know, a, a stock I mentioned in the in the comments earlier, um, Burberry, um, a lot of marginal of the available marginal capital went into Burberry at very very depressed prices last year, um, and. You know, of course, I'm 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 pleased with the the bounce in that company's that company's price since it's Nadir last year. But again, to repeat myself, the 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 latent value in the revenue base of Burberry as it gets towards the end of this transition from. Um, <laughs> Low, lower end luxury to, to to genuinely luxury sales. The, the the valuation that you could ascribe to revenue to Burberry's revenues today to us is much higher than would have been the case two or three years ago. And yeah, let's let let's hope that um, there is a roaring twenties and that. Taking advantage of that opportunity last year was um, was a timely thing to do. I think you know when I look back at at twenty twenty and to a degree into twenty twenty one, I'm not sure this is a a regret, and it's not really a disappointment with the company because you know it's pointless. But things are what they are. But Relex again. I know I mentioned Relex. Ninety um, percent, maybe more than ninety percent of Relex's business today seems to us to be so wonderfully positioned for the the bull market trends that we have seen, and I suspect we're going to continue to see uh, around the world. <clears throat> Just such a shame that um, that exhibitions. Um, d division has been uh, a drag on both earnings and, and understandably sentiment for that for that share price as well uh, again looking forwards yeah got 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 to hope that as that exhibition's business stabilizes and perhaps accelerates next year we get a we get a big catch up and a re-rating in relex that would be that would be very very welcome Thanks. We've probably got time for two to three uh, further questions. Next one is how is how is uh, ESG integrated into your analysis and portfolio construction processes? Well, it's a great question, um, and it's a great question to ask me <laughs> because I'm the um, I'm the chair of Linsell Trains Limited's um, relatively new, newly constituted. Um, um, uh, committee, uh, so I'm absolutely the person to to, to ask that question. Um, I, I, I would say that um, ESG is absolutely central um, and intrinsic to the way that we think about allocating uh, allocating capital. You know, we, we are known as very, very long-term strategic buy and hold investors, uh, and we are, uh, and we will continue to be. But wh when you consider allocating capital in the way that we do, which is on a decade or more than a decade time horizon, it's so crucial that we're invested in companies that meet and are ahead of consumer and societal um, changes in attitude or, 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 or behaviours. So, you know, we, we, we've always encouraged the companies that we're invested in to 
not just think about those issues, but look to preempt and re- respond respond to those issues. And you know, without being overly complacent, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, we're we're we congratulate the majority of the companies that we're invested in for their far sightedness. Um, Slightly changing the subject here, but but it, it's still intrinsic, of course. That in addition to the time horizons that that we have, which necessitate thinking about ESG issues, um, the 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 preferences that we have for industry choices, by and large, means that our portfolios just have lower capital intensity. Than the um, than than the benchmarks that that, that we're measured against, um, you know, and that that that's a useful starting point for us. We understand that we we've, we've got to continue holding the companies to task, uh, uh, you know, and and our, and our own business. But yeah, we 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 start from a position where there's much more intellectual capital on average across our portfolios than physical capital and you know that's that that's a good that's a good place to be um we are my colleagues and i you know we we're we're in the middle of um increasingly systematizing these esg questions that we're, we're asking all of the companies that, that that we're invested in. I think we can do more there to ensure that we know the half dozen critical issues for each company, and that we can pursue those at e- each time that we engage. So uh, there's there's more to be done, but yeah, I think we start from quite a strong position. Right. Uh, probably the final question now. The compounding characteristics that you elegantly laid out for the stocks you own may already be reflected in the price. How do you consider the price you are willing to pay? Um, <clears throat> there is a, you know, as is evidence, and as I've just reiterated, there, there is there is a tendency in the way that we. We think about running money to just want to let the 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 compounding continue and not to fuss and fret overly about about short term valuations. Um, I, I mean, ha- having said that, that there are two rules of thumb that that we use. Um, uh, 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 one of, one of which is a is a kind of moving rule of thumb, which is we follow very very closely transactions that take place between companies um, for for the sorts of assets or brands that we're invested in. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking for a validation that our conception of value. <laughs> Is being um, being supported by transactions transactions between companies. Um, so I don't know. I you know this is a trivial example, relatively trivial example. But earlier this year, Planters, the nut business, <laughs> peanuts, salted peanuts, um, that business was sold by Kraft Heinz. Um, for around, uh, I think, three and a half times its annual revenues. You know, that's a very useful marker for us looking at parts of, I don't know, Mondelez's business or parts of Unilever's business to a- assess whether or not, you know, their, their values may be, may be getting stretched. And, you know, evidently, because we still own them, we, we, we don't think so. Um, uh, I, the, the 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 other rule of thumb that that w- we've worked on um, uh, it, it, it is that um, on a post hoc basis, multiple decay po- post hoc basis, it, you you can 
you can work out that those businesses that are capable of compounding reliably over many decades ought, in inverted commas, to be worth uh, you know, over, over 30 times earnings. Um, in other words, earn, earnings yields of, of, of around three. And I, I guess that's that's the sort of backstop that we might have in our minds constantly to 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 help us judge whether or not the the other investors' appreciation is full or otherwise. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to squeeze one more in. Uh, how is the portfolio position for rising inflation's higher interest rates, as we've said today? Who's saying there's going to be higher inflation and higher interest rates? Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not saying there won't be, but but um, yeah, I, 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 it, it, just to reiterate, in in my experience, certainly my experience, attempting to add value to equity portfolios by considering possible shifts in in the macro environment it's 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 not added great value certainly from my um from from my experience um yeah i'd, I'd say that the the our portfolio um all of our portfolios that there's, there's a combination of um businesses with strong pricing power um I, I, you know, again, I mean, I'd, I'd evidence these beverage companies, particular spirits companies. You know, just just in April, it looked it looks as though there were nine percent uh, price increases across the U.S. spirits industry um, year on year. Um, we, we've got so we've got definitely companies with pricing power. Um, we've got companies, particularly in the financial sector that are arguably beneficiaries of rising interest rates, um, partly because they earn an interest rate margin, partly because the volatility around interest rates drives drives transactions. Um, and I, I'd also say in the end, if we've got our stock selection right, that actually what we're invested in are, are businesses with secular growth. And if we're right about that, that should take care of, uh, of interest, rate, interest rate and inflation volatility.